If you have an interest in horses and love learning more about horses, the horse industry, teaching, or even managing your own horse business, then you're in the right place. We would love you to join us on our mission, which is to improve the lives of horses around the world through the education of riders, handlers, and trainers. So get comfortable, listen in, and enjoy. This is another of our popular Listener's Choice interviews, which we're playing over the weekend. We've chosen the most popular interviews for you to select the Listener's Choice winner. If you're not sure how the Listener's Choice competition works, have a look at horsechats.com slash choice for the rules and the leaderboard. I'm pleased to introduce John and McLean here today. John has been a previous guest on 042 and also episode 144. Initially, he came as a guest and introduced himself to us. You know all about how he started with horses, people have influenced him, and just some basic things that he's learned with horses. Then he came back on episode number 144, talked about initial foal handling. So this is really a follow-on lesson from the lessons within 144, and this one today is 10 Steps for Further Foal Handling. How are you, Jonna? I'm marvellous. How are you, Glenna? Good, good. Jonna, before we start these 10 Steps, can you talk a little bit, just briefly, about the previous episode with initial foal handling? Because that should all already be done before people start this further foal handling. So if you can just talk a little bit about that, and then we'll step in and do these 10 steps for further foal handling. Okay. Glennis, in the previous episode, we talked about setting up the environment so that we don't have any outside interference and making sure that the outcomes are not going to be affected by noises, cars, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Also, the immediate environment needs to be controlled for the stable, for the yard, making sure there's no objects around. That's all centred around safety. And then we also talked about making sure that we've got control of the mare, very good control of the mare, so very good groundwork on the mare. This is primary, and it's also going to be quite relevant in our next section as well because ultimately what we would like to have happen is to be able to dictate really accurately every single step that this foal takes for the rest of its life, every time it's attached to a person via a lead rope, and then ultimately when it's broken in on the saddle. So this is the makings of the horse. Yep. And I really liked something that you said in that initial foal handling. I can't remember the exact words, John, but it was basically always giving the horse the chance to say yes. You know, they're always going to say yes. You're never going to put them in a position where they're going to say no. And I think that's all about the little steps, isn't it? Just asking them just enough so that they'll clearly understand and say yes and learn from that. It's exactly right, Jen. It's it's about the setup. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I said something along the lines of always making sure that the door is open, that the horse will be able to provide you with a yes answer. So it's actually more likely than unlikely because you've set it up very well. You know, I think the analogy I made was making a house and if you're putting good foundations and the rest is easy this is the same yeah yeah all right so if we can start off the first step which is understanding pressure release principles the light signal first and the stronger until the first step and then instant release and classical conditioning principles which really is a review of that previous lesson isn't it would you be able to just talk about that it is, in fact, a, a bit of a review, and that's the thing about horse training. It does sometimes the information get a little monotonous, but really the pressure release principle is a fantastic one, especially at this point in foal handling, initial foal handling, for people to be able to get really good at their timing and their pressure. Mm-hmm. And if we can do that, then we become better handlers. The welfare of the horse is being thoroughly looked after, and we are also operating in a safe manner. As far as the classical conditioning of the horse, being able to get the horse to be able to respond to anything other than pressure is makes the horse feel a little bit less threatened by people. Being able to touch it all over is really important, of course, and that is our centerpiece. The horse is not afraid. Yeah. All right. The next step to talk about is the pressure angle clock, and I'd like you to explain that because it's a term that may not be out there for the broader horse community. So if you can explain what a pressure angle clock means, that would be great. The pressure angle clock I devised about seven years ago, and it's basically if you imagine that the horse or the foal is facing 12 o'clock, and so its rear or its tail is at 6 o'clock, that means that when we apply pressure to the horse, 
the lead rope or to the foal in this case and to the head collar, there are some areas and angles that we should never apply. So I sent you an, an email with a picture of that clock and the clock reads 12 o'clock is green, 10 to 12 is blue, 5 to 12 is blue, 5 past 12 is a blue line and 10 past is as well. When we say the hour hand is at quarter to 12, that is the angle of the lead rope to the horse. That's, we really must try to avoid making the angle any more than 90 degrees. Mm-hmm. This is where we can do physical damage to the horse. The horse will maybe get a little bit frightened and possibly flip over. We wish to avoid all those circumstances. Yep. And the same as for the offside, which is now quarter past 12. So what we're going to do is we're going to slowly try to train the horse, maybe starting at quarter to 12 and quarter past 12, just with single steps, Mm -hmm. then refine that as the pressure of the lead rope becomes better understood by the foal, then it will become refined to 10 to 12 and 10 past 12, and then it'll be 5 to 12, and then it'll be 5 past 12. And then ultimately what we want the foal to understand is that when we apply pressure at 12 o'clock, it now knows the answer. Yep. And that's yep. the keystone to tying a horse up, to leading mm-hmm. it, leading it off another horse, leading it off anything at all. So this is critical. Um, I devise this clock so that people have a very clear understanding of the angles that they should be in and the angles that are really a no-go zone. Yeah, yeah. And I think that image of the pressure angle clock, we'll make sure that we've got it on Horse Chats. It'll be horsechats.com slash John and McLean 3 or just search for John and uh, we'll be able to have that image. Yeah, yeah. Great, great. All right. Now, you're talking next about the horse being touched or groomed with little anxiety. So tell us about signs of anxiety because someone might just think the horse is enjoying it. Mm. So if you can talk about the signs of anxiety and things that we're trying to avoid there. Anxiety can come in different forms, but primarily anxiety is usually exhibited by a horse's flight response, as we know, and, of course, movement of the legs is a primary sign. Another primary sign is fast breathing, obviously eyes really wide, nostrils really wide as well, ears flicking in all directions and looking quite unsettled. The ears aren't in a, um, in a fixed position. They're, they're very alert and moving a lot. And also touching the horse and feeling its temperature. This is the one that I use the most. I really need to make sure that my foal is not becoming so stressed by the circumstances or my training or both and having an increased temperature because overheating horses, you know, horses are really designed for the pull, but being able to do damage to a horse by overheating it is much simpler than most people think. Mm, mm. Can you talk about the eyes, the nostrils and the ears flicking? Is that something that you'd see in a wild horse? And is there a reason that the nostrils would be wider, the eyes wider and the ears flicking backwards and forwards? These are all primary inputs for the horse. The horse has the largest eye of of any mammal compared to its body size, so it takes a lot of information in through its eye. It's also nocturnal, so they need to be large as well. But the ears as well, they are independently mobile, so they can hear things from the front and the back simultaneously. That helps them work out exactly where the threats are coming from. The nose is a fantastic, or the, the, the nasal passage itself, is, as we know with the flamen response, a great way of being able to sample the air to see if they can smell danger. Mm -hmm. So we have the nostrils sampling, we have the ears sampling, and we have the eyes sampling. So they have three different ways, all simultaneously acting to search for anything that may be a threat and then working out really what their escape pattern is best suited for that action. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good, good. So now step number four, we've got horse to be quietly manoeuvred near the mare with the cradle technique. Would you be able to explain the cradle technique a little bit more? Yes. The cradle technique is probably one of the first touchings that you will have with a foal. We don't want to lean over a fence and touch the foal like some people try to do if they're not very experienced with horses. So then you touch the foal and then the foal runs away. That's exactly what we don't want. So we use a cradling technique in a situation where We can put our, say, our left arm under the horse's neck, a little under its neck, about three quarters of the way down, and our right arm behind its tail, so that when we are able to touch it, we can then use this cradle technique to be able to restrain the foal. It's like a, uh, it's a bit like a foal crush, I guess, but with a lot more clearer boundaries because it's malleable because it's your arm. So if you can Mm -hmm. feel the 
uh, Foley's putting pressure against your left arm because it wants to go forwards, then you can feel that. It also is the same for backwards as well. It also means that this is the very first introduction that the fold gets with pressure release systems, so it's a very good one to be able to get some idea and put you in a safer position because you're now beside the fold. You also have some control over its head and neck, which means that being bitten or being struck are limited because you're now pretty much at its girth. And you can still rub and do that and feel and massage the horse across its top line and its neck, and you can then feel whether that massaging and moving your hands actually puts any pressure on your cradle because if it does, then you need to keep doing it until you can feel the foal relax and actually just stand, not putting pressure on your left arm or your right arm, just standing there enjoying it. Mm -hmm. The trouble with this is if you do too much of this, the foal will want to groom you. (laughs) And of course, when animals groom, you'll probably get nipped a little bit. So we have to be careful with our left arm that we don't allow too much head and neck flexion so as the horse is able to do that. So mm. it's about you grooming the horse, not the other way around. So we have okay. to be careful with that. Okay. And I like the way that each of the steps is sort of still going back to that welfare of the horse and safety of the handler. You know, what's going to make it more safe and also thinking about the welfare of the horse. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Well, that's right. I mean, as we all get older, Dennis, we all become more aware of how important these factors are and people first and horses second. So that's what safety and welfare is, right? Yeah, yeah. I think more aware, but also I think, there's a more general awareness of, you know, you don't have to just go and, you know, if you think of the Wild West Cowboys going around and lassoing horses and things like that, I think that there's other ways, yeah. So we're talking now about mimicking head collar placement. So if you can talk about that. Yes, head collar placement. Uh, we're continuing on. So we've got our cradling and cradling is working quite well. We can even get to our cradling technique where we can get the horse to maybe take a little sideward step and then maybe a little backward step. So we can begin to manoeuvre the horse with the cradling technique and then it will actually just take one step and then stand there in a slightly new position and then we can continue on um, habituating the horse to touching. When Mm -hmm. we continue that further around the head and neck area, the head is an area that most horses don't like being touched around. It's quite a sensitive area and, of course, it's got all their defence mechanisms there. So, you know, you're asking the horse, is it all right if I groom all your weaponry, in other words, all all the inputs for ears and eyes and smells so they're obviously quite sensitive there they've got big long whiskers so they're very sensitive to touch as well so situating a horse to touching in all those areas is crucial and we need to be able to do that on both sides and then we want to get to the point where we can exactly mimic the placement of the halter by doing this without the halter because we all need to be good at that and keep really well versed in this because the horse will then well, the, the foal in this case will try moving backwards, try moving forwards, try putting its head up, try putting its head down, try putting its head to the right and to the left. We need to know what these outcomes will be and mimicking the halter placement will reduce the likelihood because now we only have one variable and that variable is now we're holding our halter. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Good. Wait, can you hear anything? No? That's because we're waiting for someone with a good quality horse product to be advertised here. If that's you, then contact us, horsechats at horsechats.com, and we'll send you the details. Thanks. All right, now the next thing you've got here as a step is putting both the mare and the foal's rumps into a corner or a wall. You've got on the mare's near side. Yes. Mm. So I've got the foal now on the mare's near side, and I've got my handler. The handler is in a slightly compromised position, doesn't matter where you put them, unless you think you can tie the mare up and keep her there. That's a little harder. There's a single operator that takes a little bit more skill. But let's say if we've got a handler holding the mare, the wall is now on the offside of the mare and the foal is now on her near side. We're doing this because the mare has primarily had most of her contact with humans, tacking up, tacking down, leading, all done on the near side. Mm -hmm. So we're doing this for the mare's sake. Then we put the foal on the near side. The foal is completely you know, unbiased in terms of side, so it really matters not. But we put the foal there, touching the mare, and then we're able to mimic our touching everywhere, especially around the head area. It also means that if we have their rump towards the wall, the most likely flight response we have by putting a halter on the nose will be a backward step. Well, because we've put the, uh, the foal's bottom towards the wall, when we place the nose piece over the foal's nose, it will probably try putting its head up and as a second resort, it will probably try going backwards. Okay. And that's 
why we put it that way, yes. All right. So that was number seven about applying the halter with the fold up close. Now, initially, it's without the lead rope. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. And the reason I put that in, and I do this every time, because I don't need to be looking after a lead rope and a head collar as well, because the point here is not leading the hole. The point is education. Mm -hmm. So education is best done when you only have one variable. I haven't said this before, but everything that I do in every single case, whether it be difficult horses or just breaking in horses, I make sure I only ever change one thing because then if it goes wrong, I know what the one thing is. Mm. Whereas if I have three variables, how would I possibly know? So I take the lead rope off and put the head collar on and I can fluff around and adjust it and take it on and take it off and take it on and take it off. And practice doing that, making sure my buckles are easily undone and I can do undo them and do them up fluently enough not to scare the foal. So I get good at that before I put the head collar on. I check the head collar out thoroughly and make sure that all these adjustments can be done without any jerking fast movements. That done, I'm happy with the uh, halter. And then if I'm breaking in the, uh, or when I say breaking in, I mean the halter education for the foal, I will ask the owner, I'll say, are you happy with the fit of this halter? Mm -hmm. So I don't make the judgment usually because it's usually for a client. So I say, are you happy with that? And if the bottom piece is a little bit dangly and a bit loopy, I'll say, I'd like to tidy this up because if the foal tries to scratch it off in the paddock when you let it go, it'll get its hind leg caught in there. I think we should take this up. So I do offer advice, but I ask for their inputs as well because they might say, well, you know, I don't want to tuck this in here. I don't want to tuck it in there or I would like it a little bit higher. I'd like it to be a little bit lower. And there's a bit of variation with the head colour, so I'd take some time with that. And then I apply my lead rope. Okay. Once you've applied the lead rope, that's step number eight. You're talking about paying close attention to the foal's leg placements and applying pressure at 20 degrees to the front. So talk about the foal's leg placement at this stage. Let's presume that the foal is on the near side of the mare. You are standing as the foal handler on the near side and my assistant is holding the mare in position. My assistant wouldn't be holding the mare. The mare has been trained to park in this position. There's no weight in her hand. Yep. or his hand, and the mare's quite comfortable because the foal is touching it. So let's presume that the foal's front legs, the off four leg, the right-hand front leg, is slightly forward of the near side or the left front leg. That is a perfect opportunity now to be able to apply pressure, as you said, 20 degrees or, say, 10 to 12, and then quietly use a light aid on the pressure of the lead rope. So you're giving the foal a little cue and then... Of course, he won't step from that cue because he doesn't know what that is yet. And then you go, and now take a step. So I ask, and then I quietly build up a little bit of pressure. So I get that one right front leg, take a very tiny left step. And then as soon as the foal's front leg has hit the ground, you should release the pressure immediately. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I can't emphasize this enough. So it's helping you understand what pressure is required to move that leg. Yep. It's also giving you the opportunity to be able to get good at releasing pressure. This is all about releasing pressure. People are very good at applying it, but they're very poor at removing it. Mm -hmm. And this is the cornerstone for training horses ethically. Okay, okay. And then you're talking about applying pressure, releasing pressure. Where's the reward there? Is it in the application of the pressure or the releasing of the pressure? You always ask really good questions, Jenna. <laughs> um, you know, the reward for the horse is about the release of the pressure, like it is when we ride. When we ride a horse, we ask with our legs for the horse to go frontwards, and when it does go frontwards, then we release the pressure with our legs. It's exactly the same. So the incentive for the horse is what profits you and what profits you not, which is mm -hmm. you know, the same as the old Tom Roberts books that some Australians may have read and probably all horse people should read. It's a great reference to really making sure that people understand that the biggest reward you can provide your horse with is not patting your horse and not giving it food, but having really clear signals. So the best welfare thing you can ever do for any animal is actually just train it well. So that's, that's what we're doing with our foal. So we've now trained our foal to, well, we haven't trained it yet. We've now got our first response. We've got our first basic response. It's not obedient yet. The definition of obedient is at the pressure of the light aid comes first, at the aid of the light pressure, or I should just say light pressure because that is the cue of the aid, that the foal's leg move, and that's the aim, that's the outcome, this is where we're going. So we repeat that again. So let's say now I apply the lead rope and the foal takes a step to the left with its right front leg, and then immediately, as soon as I release, it puts it back. That's fine, no problems at all. And it puts it back in such a position that it is slightly forward of the right front leg again, then I'll say with that leg, okay, now just step one step again to the left. So I'll keep practicing that 
And if the pole then starts to leave the leg there, then I'll be very quiet and very still and in a soothing voice say what a good boy is. I may even lower my posture so I'm less threatening. Mm -hmm. So I'll take all pressure away. I may step away a little bit too. So that was really good. So I'm rewarding him not just by releasing the pressure, but I'm rewarding him by making my whole body less threatening in terms of posture because we're quite threatening as, as objects to a fall over, as you know. Mm -hmm. And then I keep repeating this to the point where I can feel that the amount of pressure required to make a leg move left or right is starting to get lighter and quicker off the command. Mm -hmm. Now training is beginning. Good. It hasn't happened yet. It's not trained, but it's beginning. And that's why I drew the plot. So I will start at 10, 2, 12, and I'll do four to five repetitions. And then slowly as I can feel, and it could be left, one step left and one step right, and then repeat that on the off side in the off direction. So now I have the foal, the mare is now on the off side of the foal, and I'm able to repeat that on both sides. So now I'm from a light pressure, I'm able to get the foal's reactions to occur at the cue, not at the increase of pressure. And now training is starting to consolidate because now it's replicatable so i can replicate it and i can then say yes i've got four to five good steps off a really light pressure mm -hmm. great mm -hmm. in the session walk out good good if you're an equestrian coach or a horse riding instructor or even if you aspire to be one have a look at the free video series for horse riding instructors on the horse chats website go there now have a look horsechats.com now, you've got a note here about hot days or the foal stressed and the timing of yeah. the session. So can you talk yeah. a bit about the timing of the session? Yeah, the timing of the session is always governed by the anxiety of the foal or the anxiety of the mare. If the mare's anxious state is high, I can promise you it will just be a little bit, it's, it's infectious, of course, we all know that. So the foal will have that state as well. Touching the foal and feeling how hot it is, seeing how quickly it's breathing, making sure no no considerable patches of sweat are breaking out on the pole's neck or the mare's neck. Mm -hmm. So really just making sure that their welfare is thoroughly looked after. Okay. Now that's good. So it just means that now we have to make sure that the session isn't too long for the horse to cope with and that we finish with that because we can always come back tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you say too long, how many minutes are you looking at? Let's say we've got the halter on and we're doing our initial handling step. Mm -hmm. It's not measured by time. And this is how I teach with my lessons. It's not governed by time. Time has nothing to do with this. It's got to do with outcome. And my outcome is four to five good repetitions, more improved than the last time, end of session. Yep. But just generally, though, you know, so people have got a bit of an idea. Oh, maybe 20 minutes most. Okay. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So it's not long in terms of time. So I think the last time I had a whole group of weanlings to do, I did 25 in the boxes and I was finished in about an hour and a half. Okay. So it's not long. Yeah. And they learn, don't they? No, that's exactly right. And they start to like it because they know the rules. You know, the most most amazing thing for horses is that it becomes predictable for them. They know what the cue is. They know what they have to do to make it go away, and they latch onto that. And it's almost a security blanket in the end. Mm. So mm. it becomes a really marvellous, powerful thing. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's good. That's good. John, I've really enjoyed talking to you today. I think the 10 steps for further fold handling, again, have been very educational, brilliant for people, especially those that are breeding their own horses and may not have ever had their own foals before, to give them some yes. steps, to give them some um, clarity on what to do. And, you know, I think keeping the welfare of the horse and safety of the handler in mind at the whole time, that's good. That's right. And the other thing that is important that most studs will have and they already have this facility. When the foal is born, one of the first things they'll do is the mare needs to be examined. So she's going to be asked to be walk into a crush. And in that crush will be a foal section for the foal to stand in. Near mum, touching mum. Perfect. This is the perfect position to start giving him a little rub and having a feel and making sure that he's okay. This is where the education starts or fails is when we don't have proper equipment, facilities or training to be able to produce the outcomes. You know, we just hope that being able to have a foal in the paddock that will be able to catch it one day probably won't happen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, that's been good. And now I'm looking forward to the next steps. You know, we've got the further foal handling, so we'll keep going with this series. And uh, hopefully everyone else is getting as much benefit and enjoyment out of it as I am. It's been great. Thanks very much, Jonna. Thank you very much, Glennis. I appreciate it. I look forward to the next final foal handling session with you. Thank you for your time. Okay, bye. 
Bye. Now, if you're still there, you probably know that I'm absolutely passionate about education within the horse industry. That's why I host this podcast. My other venture is Online Horse College. Have a look now at onlinehorsecollege.com and I'll see you over there. Remember that our comments and instructions are general in nature and do not take into consideration your individual horses or your individual ability and circumstances. If you enjoyed this podcast, then please leave your comment below.